Well, thank you very much for everyone who took time out of your day to attend. Uh, my name is Ginger Grant, and I'm going to be talking about machine learning with R. I know a lot of times when people think of machine learning, they think, oh, I have to go use a specialized application for that. And you don't. Um, both R and Python have a number of different libraries that can be used to do machine learning. And I'm going to be talking about how you can do that today with R. A little bit uh, about myself. I um, am a senior consultant here at Pragmatic Works. I am a Microsoft Data Platform MVP, and I do a lot of speaking. And I consider myself an amateur uh, data analytics person. I've been um, working pretty hard on it the last oh, year and a half, and have a number of um, blog posts on it as well. And I'm really happy to be able to have the opportunity to talk more about it today. So, with that, what is machine learning? Well, machine learning has a lot of definitions. I was talking to a client not too long ago, and he's like, that's not machine learning, that's statistics. Well, machine learning encompasses statistics. I think the best example that I've heard of when it comes to actually thinking about um, machine learning was a contest that um, a site called Kaggle did a couple years back. Kaggle is a site that generally holds contests for people to do analytical challenges. And one of the challenges they had was to try to find the doubt what the difference or create an algorithm that could tell the difference between a cat and a dog. Um, this test was performed by taking over 25,000 images of cats and dogs where they were actually labeled as a cat or a dog. And then after that, the algorithm was applied then to teach the computer which one was a cat and which one was a dog. Then they used 15,000 different images that weren't labeled to see how successful the algorithm was. And when you think about machine learning, a lot of times you know, people don't understand what that is. Well, think about this when you're you know, t talking to a small child, you know, your kids, little boys or little girl says, hey, that's a doggy. And you're like, no, that's a kitty. Neither one is a cat or a dog. But they figure it out over time. And the figuring it out over time is done by application of rules over an object. And computers are really good and really fast at doing recall. And what they need to be trained to do is use a series of algorithms to predict that. I mean, for example, you could say, oh, well, the difference between a cat and a dog is a cat always has pointy ears. Well, Boston Terrier's got pointy ears, so that's not going to work. Um, they both have four legs, a tail and fur, so, and different lengths and different kinds, but what makes a cat a dog? Well, there's various algorithms that you can do to determine physical characteristics that'll let you know that that's grumpy cat and dog is not. So the computer program does this differently, but, and there is specialized software that can be used to create it, but there, the, all the software is is relying on algorithms that have been created since the 50s to solve complex problems and have machines do this. Uh, one of the more famous ones is Big Blue by IBM, which took a whole bunch of looking at chess games and analyzed the patterns. And so a lot of what machine learning is doing is pattern analysis, determining patterns over time. And a lot of times that's what predictive analytics is too. It's looking at data and determining what's the relationship between this data and that data. How, what's the same or different between this year and last year and what can we do to identify what we can do in the future based on that. There's a number of different kinds of machine learning. There's what's called supervised learning. And in supervised learning, it's um, you know what you have for inputs and you know what you have for outputs. For example, and um, the example with cats and dogs, you know exactly that that's a, that's supervised learning. You have um, two sets of pictures and you're going to get a predictive set of outputs. So that's very supervised. Of course, when people are not supervised, you can get any kinds of results that you want. The inputs are known, but the outputs are unknown. So you're looking for things where you're not sure what the answers are. These two classifications of machine learning basically are then are broken down into different kinds of algorithms. So there's a number of standard classifications for algorithms. And these are important to know to determine what you're going to be doing, how you're going to be approaching your machine learning problem. Anomaly detection is most often thought about in terms of credit card companies. If you've ever been shopping at some point in time and you bought a big ticket item and 
um, your credit card company called you. The reason that they called you is they did anomaly detection. They determined a purchase was outside of the pattern that, you, that has been established for you. So with anomaly detection, we're looking at the outliers, the things that don't happen that often, and trying to investigate what those mean and what value that they can have. Um, classification is kind of the reverse of anomaly detection. We're looking at um, determining if something belongs in a certain classification. Is it a cat? Is it a dog? Classifying you know, various variables into certain patterns. Clustering is basically looking at a whole bunch of data and trying to find groups and meanings within the data, trying to draw boxes around it. Um, one thing that you may be looking at or is very common is, is for example, people who are about to leave. Are you going to um, get rid of cable? You know, what do you have in common with the other people who've recently got rid of cable? And then finally, the one that we are going to be looking at in more detail today is regression analysis. And regression analysis is when you're looking for relationships between variables. Um, one very common one is linear analysis. Um, linear analysis is um, often looking at how things relate. One thing to determine, it kind of gets difficult to see which algorithm that you might want to employ. So there, Microsoft did create a pretty good starting out spreadsheet. Um, I do have a link for this um, cheat sheet on my blog. And I know it says for Azure Machine Learning, I also have a link on my blog for many of the uh, uh, algorithms that are used here. For example, one class SVM is not something specific to um, Azure ML. It is a standard algorithm that's used within the industry. Same with PCA-based anomaly detection, ordinal regression, Poisson rejection. These are very common algorithms that are used in machine learning. And one of the things that's really neat about R is R is very extensible and has millions of people out there busy writing various libraries to perform these tasks. So if you want to take a look at, at this particular um, cheat sheet and you're thinking, well, shoot, can I do that in R? Chances are the answer to that is yes. It's, may, you may find it a little bit more challenging or it may be easier depending on the algorithm. And I do have links for all the for R libraries that you can use to implement this cheat sheet on my blog post that was on Saturday. All right, so let's take a look a little bit closer look at linear regression. For linear regression, we're looking at the relationship for two objects. For example, if the um, temperature is really hot, do you sell more frozen yogurt? Well, the answer to that is yes, but that's not to say that people don't buy it when it's 20 degrees. I can attest to that. Been there, done that. Um, generally speaking, with, with linear regression, you can visually determine the results by looking at a graph. But what if you don't want to look at a graph? What if you're interested in using that value into another algorithm? You're like, because you want the computer to take your results and go forward with them. You want to know, okay, so these, are, these relate. Now, what am I going to do with the related items? I want to classify them. I want to categorize them. I want to report on them. Well, one of the big strengths of R is its ability to create visualizations. Let's face it, a lot of times you just want a number, and you want the number to tell you whether or not the, uh, there is some kind of relationship, so you can use that number in, in um, a later process. One way to determine whether or not linear regression or are, are things are really related is using a Pearson correlation. And a Pearson correlation is basically assigning values to the various numbers. And those numbers will tell you whether or not something is related or not. So let's take a little bit closer look at the Pearson correlation. What you are measuring with Pearson is if there is a positive correlation, if they're, you know, just like our previous example with yogurt and uh, frozen yogurt and, and heat, the, there's a positive correlation there. In the center diagram there where it shows just a bunch of random variables, there's no correlation at all. And the other thing is there may be a negative correlation which is also very important to measure to determine the impact of, of one variable on another. Um, the algorithm I put on there as well, if you wish to um, use the algorithm, I use the formula, so I generally don't, but it's important to know that there is you know, fundamental math behind all of this and a lot of information on 
the internet to be able to research this a little bit further. I believe the Pearson cor correlation was um, first applied in 1880. So again, this is an application of existing technology. Uh, when you are looking at correlations, you're looking at if you're looking at strong correlations, you're looking at you know 0.5 to uh, there's an error on that slide to one. You will generally only see a one as if you're comparing a variable to yourself. A small correlation is 0.1 to 3. If you've got that kind of relationship, your variables are very loosely tied together. All right. So when you are doing, when you, we're going to be taking a look at doing a Pearson correlation in R and also looking at creating linear regression in R. So let's talk a little bit more about R. So if we're talking about developing um, R for SQL Server, which is what we want to do, you might want to check your version of your of R. Believe it or not, I know that everyone talks about R as if it's monolithic, but there are uh, different versions of R. The icon I have, the logo I have on the screen, yes, that is actually a logo, is for Microsoft R Open. Uh, Microsoft R Open was is a version that was actually created by Revolution Analytics, and the reason that they created it is they wanted to take advantage of some of the processor libraries that Intel had released for their math kernel. Um, if you're not too familiar with R, R was created out of a program called S that was created in Bell Labs in 1976 by John Chambers and it was migrated to R by Ross and Robert, which is why the name changed from S to R. When they wrote it, it was primarily um, back-ended in Fortran and it is single-threaded. Um, there are, have been a number of libraries that have been rewritten in C. Uh, ggplot2 is a classic one for that. But a lot of R is very slow. That's why Microsoft, or Revolution Analytics, and then you know, Microsoft released it as open source, created Microsoft R Open, because in using the math kernel libraries, taking advantage of the way that the Intel processors work, you have, the, you have some math kernel operations that are now in um, process in a multi-threaded fashion. So using, changing your version of R can make it up to 38% faster, of course, depending on the calculations that you are using within R. So um, it's, it's perfectly free. It doesn't matter which one you use, but um, I'm all about doing things faster. So what you want to do if you're developing R within SQL Server is you want to develop it, then migrate. If you have messed with SQL Server, you realize it's not much of an R tool. Um, it's best to put the R code there, not create the R code there. It's not designed for that. There is a tool. There are two tools that are designed for that, though. Um, the most popular one is, of course, R Server. R Server is the um, GUI that most people use for developing R. Of course, I'm not most people, so I feel compelled to be different, and I'm using Visual Studio with R tools loaded. Uh, the reason that I do this, um, I kind of got used to doing things in Visual Studio, so why not do R there as well? And I also think the IntelliSense and the, the debugging capabilities are a little bit better. Um, they, and that's not that R Studio ha does not have them, they do, I just like the ones in um, Visual Studio a little bit better than R Studio, but whichever one you want to use, it just doesn't really matter. The next thing that I wanted to take a look at is something that I don't think a lot of people will know about and that is the use of um, custom monitoring reports in SQL Server. I do have a um, link to this on my blog from today to give you the uh, location in GitHub where you can download these for yourself. There's not a whole lot out there yet in terms of how to monitor how R is running SQL Server and these reports are kind of a good first step to kind of see what's going on. So with that, let's demo linear regression. So I'm going to go ahead and open Visual Studio. You may think, hey, this doesn't look anything like the Visual Studio that I've been using. Well, the one thing that um, it looks different is that our tools are installed. If you have our tools, you have the um, implement the data science settings. And one thing when you click on this button, you'll see this warning and it's going to tell you that um, you're probably going to want to 
export your settings. And the reason why is that this is a really good environment for writing R. It's a really lousy environment for writing SSIS. So you're going to have to change things back if you go back and forth, say, between um, other environments. So go ahead and listen to this warning and uh, export your settings. When you do click on this button, you will get this format right here where you've got the standard windows that appear in RStudio. This is where um, it's, uh, the script is written. This is the results here, kind of like Visual, uh, kind of like um, Management Studio. Here's where you write the code, and here's where you look at the results. This section here has got the Solution Explorer, so you can see the packages that I have within this project, any plots that I might have, and help. Um, unlike a lot of other uh, languages, the help in R is really pretty good. And if you want to look at help, um, the easiest thing to do is just go down here to the interactive session and let's say look at scatter plot. Oh, and it told me that I didn't have it spelled right. Well, let's look at something that I know it does. And you'll notice that um, I might get help for it right here within Visual Studio and it's pretty decent documentation. Um, R is pretty good about doing that. One thing that I did mention before is to the importance of knowing what version you're running. So I'm going to go to our tools here in options. And you'll notice that I am running the version called our server. And the reason that I am doing that is so that I have the ability to use some of the functions that are um, as come as part of Revolution Analytics. I am not using any of them today, but, of but I do not need to use those functions in order to use this version of R. The reason that I use this version of R is that I can do whatever I want to and I don't have to worry about things not working because I have the wrong version. Um, R server and of course on the client side you need to install R client as well is the specialized version of R that was created by Revolution Analytics now um, owned by Microsoft and this will um, allow for chunking capabilities and other functions that are specific to SQL's R server. So I would highly recommend if you do plan on using them, just use this driver all the time. I do have um, links available for downloading our client and MSR open so that you have the ability to install whichever ones that you want. All right. So what I'm going to do in my little experiment today is take a look at some data that's preloaded in R, one of the things that R does is it contains a whole bunch of demo code that's available so that you can take a look at it. And one of the things that I'm going to look at is some statistical information by states containing information like murder, population, illiteracy, life expectancy, and whether or not somebody was a high school graduate. And this is, so I have 50 entries here, and I'm going to create a data frame. A data frame is R's version of a table. So it is loading my data into a table and the ta that sort of thing. And the it's actually a data frame, and that is called state data. And I'm going to go ahead and execute that. This is a lot like SQL Server in that or S Management Studio in that so you can execute a line at a time. And if I'm going to go ahead and do that, you'll notice that my interactive the results are right down here. And of course, I don't see anything because all I did was you know, add something to a variable. So let's just look at state data here. And if we look at that, we'll see that we've got the states, murder, population, illiteracy, income, life expectancy, and high school graduate, just like I pulled out of the state data right here. So let's take a look at how these data relate to one another using the scatter plot matrix. So if we do that, and I can either click on this um, interactive icon here or hit control enter and I'll go back and forth. Notice that now I have a plot here. So what I've got is I've got various linear regression diagrams for com every combination of variables that I have. The ones down the center are where they're comparing it to themselves, which is why it just has the name because it doesn't really provide any meaningful um, information. But it does tell you that, for example, if we look at the relationship between murder and population, it's, while there's some outliers here, it doesn't seem to be that big of a correlation.
But if we look at life expectancy, yeah, it's a big cor big negative correlation here because if you're murdered, you're going to have a shorter life expectancy. So you would kind of expect that we would see a line the trending down like this one does. And one thing that's nice about this using the scatter plot matrix is we can see every single relationship for all of our variables. So we, we can look at the correlative factors of all of them, which is kind of neat, but it's also kind of overwhelming because then you have to remember them all and you have to figure out what you're going to do with them. There's a couple of other analyses that we can take a look at for just a couple of the various um, variables. So if we look at just um, looking at the sixth value, and the sixth value is one, two, three, four, excuse me, four, which is income, and six, which is high school graduate. So if we're going to look at income and a high school graduate, we can do a partial correlation. And if we do that, we can see that there is a pretty strong correlation because in, a pure, in the correlation, anything above five is a strong correlation. So that's not surprising. People who um, have higher incomes, also are high school graduates. You kind of expect that. If Let's take a look at illiteracy and income, another partial correlation. And we notice that there is a negative correlation. So if you are um, illiterate, your income tends to be lower, and that's what this negative number is here. It's not quite strong. It's 4, 3, but that gives you an idea that the line there would be trending down without having to look at a line. Then we can also look at some various um, correlations for significance. Let's take a look at what core data is telling us. So again, if we go to, if we don't remember or don't know what these various functions do, we can go ahead and look at help. And if we do look at this, we'll see that the what this particular function does is finds correlations and probability between elements of a matrix of the data frame. Notice that this also has a little um, curly brackets and the word psych in there. What that is, is this tells telling you that core test is coming from the psych library. I have a number of different libraries that I have loaded here, um, and psych is one of them. So this um, function is available because I loaded this psych library, and it's part of that. So that's, again, one of the extensibilities and beauty of R, you have a lot of different things that you can pull from. Matter of fact, a lot of times with R, the hardest thing to do is figure out which one is the test that's most meaningful to you. So let's go ahead and run some of these um, correlative tests. Again, we're looking at just at, at, this, at the same thing that we did here, partial correlations. But it's telling us that's 95% co that's confident. I'll scroll this up here so we can see a little bit more. And it's telling us that this is a portion of Pearson, the product moment corpo, um, correlation. And it's saying that it's 95% confident that there is definitely a correlation between the two. Notice the numbers are different. Different statistical algorithms, of course, use different results. Again, if we use look at um, income and illiteracy, we see the negative correlation here between these two, and they're 95% confident of this negative correlation between these two variables. And we can look at everything in the correlative test if we use the complete here. And if we do that, we see the probability values, again, for all of our variables. Note this is kind of similar to the way that the chart looked, in that murder compared to murder is one, go figure. And we see that the various um, correlations here, remember we were looking at our plot here for scatter for scatter plot, and we looked at murder and income, excuse me, murder and life expectancy, and we noticed a negative trend line here. Well, that points is seen here as well in 0.78, very strong correlation, but if you're murdered, your life expectancy is going to be negative. Go figure. Um, we can look at um, the fact that, that illiteracy has a very strong correlation with murder. So this gives you another way of looking at it rather than pictures and something perhaps more quantifiable that you might be able to use in another later on application. So again, this is a, a, we're using a number of different R algorithms to take a look at what is considered to be machine learning analysis, which is statistics, but it's doing an in-depth analysis on a series of variables. We're using CAN data here, but you might do something on the 
uh, addition of a new product to the number of calls that you get in a call center, for example, or there's a number of other very practical applications for linear correlation. Um, one of the things that I did with linear correlation not too long ago is I spoke with a company or did some work actually for a company that was looking at the impact of negative reviews in Amazon to their overall purchases and the length of time that negative reviews had to their Amazon purchases. And the results that they had received were rather surprising, but that's you know a really another really great um, thing that you can do. I did it with Azure Machine Learning. I could just have easily done the same kind of analysis here with R. Um, if we look at the uh, um, linear model, again, taking a look at what we're taking a look at here. If I look at LM. Oh, it's, of course, this is R, not SQL, so capitalization matters. So if I look at this linear model, I can see the, um, the, what my comparison is. Notice, though, I'm not comparing all of my values here. I'm just doing a subset. And I'm setting this value here, and then I can go ahead and plot it and see the, the relationship between murder and illiteracy. And actually, that's a pretty strong positive correlation there. I can take a look at the summary, and this is um, giving me the coefficients, residuals for the summary of this linear um, migration, and then I can look at various other properties to see how it is specifically related, and I can go ahead and plot it as well. And what this is doing is taking a look at the state data and looking at the outliers. So we can see it gave um, some names to the outliers. So I can see that, that uh, Nevada is just seemingly a, I'm doing an anomaly detection. Nevada is a real anomaly because it doesn't seem to um, be the same as other states. It seems to be lying out way outside of it. And I can see it's, again, way outside looking at the various distances. So I've got three um, graphs here. I've got three variables here. So that's why I'm looking at the three different items. But what I really am interested in is I'm looking to look at all the values that I can receive. And then perhaps I can use that in um, some further analysis. So I'm just going to do this straight Pearson calculation here. And what this will do is it will give me correlative numbers. So I see my life expectancy here. Notice you know, some of these are a little bit different literacy and I can take a look at this information and I can use it later on so this is what I'm going to want to run within SQL Server so if I go to SQL Server I'm going to run this same code here notice that this the same command that is in R is um, I'm going to be using that right here so it's the same thing um, one thing if I'm going to a nice spelling. If I'm going to uh, be using R in SQL Server, probably the first thing that I'm going to want to do is I'm going to want to make sure that SQL Server is set up correctly. It's that I can run R because I might not remember that I have it set up right. One great way of doing that is if I look at the report, the custom report for configuration, I can see that my R services were installed, my external scripts were enabled. The implied authentication is enabled as well. I can take a look at my default packages, uh, my R home, where my library paths are. This is very important because if I chose to import another library, say I wanted to add psych, I would need to make sure that that library was installed in this particular path. So, and it also tells me the version of R that I'm running. Um, kind of some very useful information as well. Uh, these reports are available on GitHub. There are uh, eight different reports that you have access to, and we're going to be taking a look at a couple of them. Another report that's kind of, that I want to take a look at is uh, resource usage. And this describes the way that R is being set up within SQL Server. I have created an external pool for our resources so that I'm better able to track it. This is not probably what you would see if you were looking at, at your um, configuration unless you had set up this external pool. When R is run in SQL Server, it runs a separate executable called launchpad.exe. Launchpad.exe is, um, is, is 
can be monitored through an external pool since it's outside of SQL Server, and that's what this is going to be tracking. And this is looking at the resources and the and what I have provided for it, and the OS and current memory consumption of, with um, SQL Server on the operating system. So taking a look now at my code, what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be executing an external script. External script is, that I'm that I'm going to be utilizing is a launchpad.exe. And I'm going to tell it that I want to run R. Um, notice that this language, you have to set it. I understand that Microsoft has plans to be able to support other languages in the future. Right now, that's R, but hey, that could change. Um, you want to insert all of your R code in the scripts section here. And the interesting thing about this is I've got an input data set. Well, my input data set, unfortunately, is called input data one. These names are not random. These names are the ones that are required by Microsoft to be able to run our scripts. So um, I realize that input data set is not input data one, but there you go. For my data, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the information from my site stats table. So if I just do a select on it, you'll see that I've got the same information that I was running natively in R. I've got the state, murder, population, literacy, income, life expectancy, and high school grad. So I've got data from R that I want to run. Oops. And that's my input. And then I'm going to want my output to be the information here in the Pearson coefficient because this is going to be my output. And I'm going to run that within SQL Server. So if I go ahead and run this, I get the same values that I would get if I was running this in R. And I can later on insert this into a table, use it for some further analysis, create it into a SQL Server job, or do a number of different things with it. The one thing also that's kind of nice that I can do if I'm looking at my custom reports here for R, if I look at my execution statistics, I probably should have done this earlier, you'll see the number of total executions on this particular instance that I have of R. Um, these are also has separate statistics for the revolution scale packages. And if I click on view SQL script, this is telling me how it is doing it. So this is the T SQL that actually generates this in the report, which is kind of neat. So you can get the behind the, the scenes look of what was being generated to get this data. So if we go back and look at the executions and see this is 26. If I go ahead and run my code again, and go back and refresh this, now it says 27. So it gives you an idea of the number of services that are being run in R. Um, a couple of other very useful reports for DBAs is whether or not somebody is connecting to it right at this very point in time. Um, I have to be really, really quick to do that so that report doesn't demo terribly well because I can't write and run at the same time. Um, the other really kind of useful report information as well is here for extended events. I know that there's a number of different questions about how do I monitor how R is running on my SQL Server box. And to do that, you're going to want to know the extended events that you might want to take a look at. And here's a list of all of them and when they're using. Now, this isn't really much of a report. This is very useful information. I wouldn't call it a report, but hey, it's listed as a report, so I'll take it because I know that I definitely would want to use this information later on. So I have the ability to do that with this particular report. Um, and I've loaded, these are all custom reports so that I can use that. If I want to make sure that I've got, um, that I want to configure R for the first time, I would run this. Um, I have already run this external scripts command, so I don't need to run this again. Um, and I don't need to reconfigure it because it's already been started. But this, if you want to just set up R for the first time, this is the command that you need to know to be able to do that. Again, not really much of a report, but very useful information. And again, to download that, click on this link right here. And these are where the custom reports that I am um, referring to all live. 
so you have the ability to use these reports. There's not a whole lot of documentation out here for them, but I think they're really kind of cool. And I provided a link and some more descriptions on what the individual reports do should you um, need to have some more information about them. So, all right, so back to slides. So today, in the, just for a little bit of summary, I want to make sure that we had some time to answer questions later on. We've just talked about what is machine learning. Um, it's the ability to find out what's a dog and what's a cat, and also what variables are related, um, whether or not a transaction or an item is outside of the norm, that would be anomaly detection. Whether or not things are related, that's clustering. And then, of course, what we spent most of our time on is linear regression to look at the relationship between variables. Um, these different algorithms, classifications, uh, we talked about them, and then we looked at how we can apply linear regression. It's not enough just to do linear regression. It's very important to be able to understand how to evaluate and analyze the results and save them in a method that's, that's useful. But yes, you can always graph them, but you may not want to have the standardized values, and those values are variable if you do something like run a Pearson correlation. Um, I also, if you are interested in doing more with um, machine learning and, um, and R, I do have some additional, um, a list of various, of, of various, uh, algorithms that are available on my blog um, from a couple days back, so you can take a look at all of them that are available. Here, let me show this to you real quick. So if you want to take a look at um, all the, a, a series of algorithms that you can use within R, got, I've got them available. All of these links go to various CRAN R libraries or other libraries so that you can download and use the libraries to be able to do this particular kind of analysis within R. Um, documentation here to be able to do that so that you can get started using R for doing all the kinds of algorithm the determination that's avail that Microsoft has, has been showing on their um, spreadsheet which is here and I also have a link to this um, cheat sheet as well but every single algorithm that you would want to be able to do I've put them I put a good good representation of them here so you can use R to do that instead and I also demonstrate a little bit about how we can run it, run R within SQL Server and, and um, also showed some ability that you have to monitor it and to see what's going on within SQL Server when R is running. So with that, Ready? are there any questions? Yes. <laughs> All right. Um... Why use Microsoft R over other analytics tools such as OpenR, Python, or MATLAB? Um, let's go those in reverse order. MATLAB is a very um, good tool with a very complex user interface and a very, um, let's say, a, a, a very lofty price tag. Um, if somebody has purchased MATLAB for you, hey, go for it. It's also extremely difficult to learn. Um, the open source version of MATLAB is Octave, again, which is used quite a lot in academia. It's a good tool, but um, it's complicated and a bit on the pricey side. Um, Python, there's a whole lot of conversation in the data community about Python versus R and which one's better. I think they're both very good tools if you are um, familiar with it. But one thing that's different between R and Python is that Python is a language that has um, uh, R and statistics and analysis bolted onto it in libraries, and R was created, I mean its original name was S for stats, R was created to do complex data analysis, so I think the focus is a little bit tighter on R, and why you would want to use Microsoft R Open versus the standard CRAN Open is because they, since they rewrote the underlying math kernel libraries, they have made them multi-threaded, so it is you can use all the same exact functionality that you can with CRAN R, and depending on what you're doing, it can be up to 38% faster. Well, I like faster. Why use something slow when you don't have to? It's multi-threaded versus single-threaded. Good, 
enough reasons for me. Okay. Um, what is the best way to integrate R into your ETL process? I think the best way to integrate R into your ETL process is, is embed it within store procedures. If you are, are fortunate enough to be using SQL Server 2016 because it's the that way you can just run R and then put the results to wherever you need to have them is, is for your ETL. Okay. Here's another one about integrating. Um, what is the best way to integrate R with Power BI? Do you mainly use R for visualizing data? Can you do modeling in Power BI R? And if you can do it, do you recommend doing modeling R in Power BI? Great question. Um, the Power BI R support has seriously increased over time. Um, it was kind of uh, not so robust, but that's been fixed. Uh, one of the latest release features is the ability to actually use your GUI of choice instead of Power BI. I think the Power BI combination is extremely powerful, and yes, I would use it. One thing that Power BI with R does is it is an is it's another way to implement Shiny and R. Um, for those of you who are unfamiliar with Shiny, Shiny is a language that was created to um, have visualizations in R in a way that users could get to them. It's a great demo tool. I think it's kind of lacking in security, um, and it's, I think it's overtly complex. Using um, R with Power BI, you get the ability to use all the visualizations that are included within R, in addition to the ones that you are able to use in Power BI. Um, you are a little bit, you're slightly limited in the number of data points. I think it's half a million, but seriously, if you can't figure out how to do a graph with less than half a million data points, maybe you might want to look at that one again. Um, and I think it's a great tool for integrating both of them because you have all the visualizations that you have with um, with R in in Power BI, and they also you have the ability to contextually manipulate um, many of them as well. So definitely, it's a great tool and a way to expose your R visualizations to a wider audience. I really think it's going to take off more, and you're going to see people use that instead of Shiny. Okay, um, is Knit R integrated, or can it be integrated into R for SQL Server? Um, I what is it net R? Is it? It says K N I T R. Knitter. Knitter. Um, okay, there we go. Not really. Uh, in terms of can it be integrated into SQL Server, it's not really um, included as part of it. So no. Um, for partial correlations, does the order of the variables matter? Example, if you provide income first, then literacy, will it give a positive number instead of a negative number? It's smart enough to have order not be important. The reason that you have a negative number is because it's considered a, it's considered a negative correlation if, there's an, if, if, the num, if the numbers trend down. For example, if you have a lower income, you know, you're chances are there's a there's a literacy if you if you're very very literate you're not going to have a, a very statistically speaking a very low income so it's going to always be a negative correlation can I use R in SQL Server to plot nonlinear regression curves like IC50 and others in kinetics basically for biochemical work yes one thing that I didn't show, but you um, have the ability to create plots within SQL Server 2016. Um, there is a really good blog post on um, SQL Server Sentry, uh, Tobias, that Tobias did. You have a number of different options for where you dis these visualizations will go. They can either be um, sent to a um, created as bitmaps and sent to a folder, or you could incorporate them um, in file stream like you would other graphics within SQL Server. So yes, you can you can do that and you can generate graphs in SQL Server as well. Is it possible to run our processes in different boxes other than SQL Server itself for scalability reasons? Good question. Absolutely. Um, Microsoft R Server is not just SQL Server compatible. Microsoft R Server was created to run R faster by taking the R code and running it not only in memory, 
but also to disk using a ch um, standard chunking me mechanisms that everybody has been using for years. What that means is, is that you all of your processes are multi-threaded, and then at the end, the results are put together, and that's what our server can, can do for you if you use the um, Rx commands that are provided in Revolution Analytics. Our server is created, um, has been designed in three different flavors, one for SQL Server specifically, one for Teradata, and one for HDFS. If you choose to run our server on a different machine other than your SQL Server box, you do have, of course, the ability to do so. Um, I would talk to your Microsoft rep because I do understand that there are some kind of licensing that you might have to consider should you choose to do so. One of the decisions that you might want to look at if you're determining whether or not you want to move our server from SQL Server is um, worrying about how much data latency you're going to have with network traffic if you migrate it to a separate box. So you might want to do some analysis of the kind of work you're doing to determine whether or not you want to separate your R server from um, SQL Server. Can we join data generated from an R script to SQL data directly or does it have to be inserted into a table first? It does not have to be inserted into a table first. Um, it's just output like you would have, if you could embed, you could use it, put it into a, a temp table or do any other kind of analysis um, that you wish to do on it. You could put it to a variable, have the variable go on in a stored proc, you're not limited. Okay. Someone wants to know if they don't really understand um, statistics, um, can they still use R? You can still use R. You don't have to understand statistics. You can generate a lot of really pretty graphs without knowing much about them. I will say that you're going to hit a wall. Um, eventually, what, one of the things that R does is R is created to provide meaningful analysis to your data using statistics and various other algorithms. So if you don't, uh, hey, I totally get not necessarily knowing it getting started, but you're going to come to a point where you're going to really need to under, be able to understand what you're what the numbers that you're getting back are telling you. And to do that, you're really going to need to um, bone up a little bit on statistics. Um, there's a pretty good edX course on statistics. It's part of the uh, Microsoft Data Science Program, which, which I'm also um, a part of. And if you're looking to bone up on statistics, I highly recommend that. Uh, can you call R from Python? Can I call R from Python? I don't know. I'm not that great with Python. Um, I don't know. Do I need all R server and R client and Microsoft R open to be installed to run R from SQL Server? Yes. I have a couple of people. A couple people asking if you're going to share your materials from the session, which I'm assuming that's a yes. Yeah, sure. I will be posting them on my blog so that you can see this with the same R script that I that I ran so that you can run it as well. And then a couple people are asking about your blog, which is up there on the bottom of the slide if you see it. Right there. Can R... Yeah, because... I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. One thing that I really highly recommend you doing is the reports that I found on GitHub. They're great. Um, download them and, and use them, and, and I think they're really helpful for figuring out what R is doing in SQL Server and how you can monitor it going forward. Okay. Uh, someone wants to know if there's any R classes um, that we can recommend. Um, he has um, someone who's doing statistics on his R server, on R, on a SQL Server. Um, in terms of classes, I again, I like the edX class uh, that's part of data science. It does a, the data science curriculum with Microsoft. I think it's 101. I think it's a really good starter for R. Um, I would steer people away from the Johns Hopkins R course. I did not find that to be helpful. I, and there are a number of them. Data Camp has got a number of them that look just great. I have not specifically taken them, but I would look at edX and, and Data Camp for our courses. I do not know of any um, R courses other than the ones that Microsoft is providing that have anything to do with how to run 
are in SQL Server. And to my knowledge, if you don't get that from Microsoft, that information is not available at this time. And I know we're working on an R class. I don't know the details of it yet, but stay tuned for that if you're interested as well. Uh, can R be used with older versions of SQL Server or only 2016? So the way R works is, is that um, when you, if, we, if I looked at the code here, um, pull this up. What this is doing is it's running this command called sp execute external, external script. That's new. That is only in 2016. And what this does is it um, spins, runs a uh, executable called launchpad.exe. Since this command is not available on any version other than 2016 and the executable is not there, it's not going to run. Um, but SQL Server 2016 Developer Edition is free. So there's absolutely no reason that you could not install this on your local box and execute everything, and it's not going to cost you a dime. So even if your company has not yet gone to SQL Server 2016, there's no reason that you couldn't become very proficient by getting yourself a free version of Developer 2016 and start using this yourself. Okay. Um, does R Open have all the functionalities, functionalities of Cran R? Does it support all packages? Yes, it is 100% compatible with, with CRAN R. It's just faster. It's the underlying um, portions of it are different. It's functionally exactly the same. How can we integrate R into SSIS? The best way, I think, to integrate R into SSIS is to call store procedures that are running R. Um, I don't know of any way of running R within SSIS natively. I don't believe that's possible. So create your um, call a store procedure, have that store procedure run an R script, and then you can take that results and do whatever you want to within SSIS. Are there any memory limitations in R when handling big data? Yes, when you have more data than you have memory, it's going to die, which is one <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's, that's your basic limitation. So how much memory do you have and how much data do you have? If you've got more data than memory, unless, of course, you are using the Revolution Analytics version. If you do that and use the Rx commands, then you have the ability to have nearly unlimited. Heck, you can always run out of disk, right? Because you can swap from data from memory to disk from and, and it, using chunking capabilities. If you do not use the Revolution Analytics, the Revo R commands, you will run out of, when you run out of memory because you put too much data in, it will blow, it will blow up. Um, it's not uncommon for R packages to do that after they've been running for three and four days. So I really recommend if you are looking at a whole bunch of big data to investigate further um, the Rx commands in um, R server. Can you use R charts in SSRS? In SSRS, not that I'm aware of. Right. I haven't heard of any, there's, to my knowledge, there's no, no integration with SSRS and R. However, um, with the Ignite conference, um, Microsoft showed Power BI um, embedded in SSRS, so in the very near future when that product announcement is out, they'll we'll have some more information about how you can do Power BI on premises in SSRS, and if you do that, then you can use R. All right, we have time for one more. Um, can R server be installed as an add-on having trouble installing deploy R for SQL Server 2016 Enterprise Edition? Can it be installed in, as an add-on? Um, our server can be installed as a separate application on another server, or uh, if that's what you're asking. Uh huh. Yes, definitely. Put it on another server. Um, you need to go through the install process and select the option R standalone. All right, great. Well, let's squeeze in one more question, and then I think I know there's a lot, um, so I'll be sure to send these on okay. you, Ginger. Um, what is the maximum file size that I can load on our server? 
See, that's a tricky question because I don't know how much memory you have. And the other thing too, determining file size, if you are using the um, XDF file size that's created as part of um, Revo R, you have a much greater uh, memory compression and data compression capability if you're using that format. So I'll have to go with it depends. There's just not inf information for me to be able to answer that. Gotcha. Okay. Well, that is, we're right at noon, so that's all the time we have for today. Um, thank you guys for joining us. Thank you, Ginger, for hosting. Um, as I said, I know we didn't get to all the questions. I know there was a couple in there we missed, so I'll be sure to send those to Ginger, and she always does follow-up blogs. She's always blogging, and her blog has a lot of information, so I urge you to go check that out. And as always, we record the session, so you'll receive an email tomorrow with the link. If you guys think of any additional questions, please feel free to email me, Liz, and I'll be happy to pass them on to Ginger. Um, thanks again, and we look forward to seeing you guys soon. Great. Thank you.